Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I'm very happy to uh, spend time here with you to share uh, the information about our new technology, uh, HDRF, and its product is called HD Rock Band, which is uh, a good tool for heavy metal analysis in the soil analysis. Okay, uh, during the presentation, uh, I will introduce four parts uh, briefly. The first one is to introduce uh, what is HD XF technology. A second, uh, I will introduce HD Roxanne product and its application and the product features and the benefits we can get from this product. And third part, uh, I will introduce the Brownfield heavy metal investigation and how does uh, engineering firms uh, do the soil, uh, do the site uh, remediation. And the last one, I'd like uh, to share you uh, one uh, case study. Okay, first the technical overview, technology overview, HDXRF. HDXRF means high definition X-ray fluorescence. Uh, first of all, uh, what is uh, X-ray? X-ray is kind of uh, a wavelength uh, is from 0 0.01 and to 20 nanometer, and uh, that is X-ray. And we can commonly see X-rays uh, in our daily life. Like sometimes we need to go to the hospital and to check X-ray of our body. Uh, that is the same X-ray with uh, the light we are using. <clears throat> and what is uh, XRF technology? Uh, X-ray fluorescence. When we see this. Uh, uh, picture, this photo, uh, this is uh, an atom, and uh, in the, uh, there are many uh, electrons there, and the one, uh, the primary X-ray radiation from X-ray X-ray source, we call it X-ray tube, and X-ray source will hit the inner uh, part of the electrons of the atom, and then uh, the electron will go out of this atom, so there will be a hole there. So uh, it's not stable for the atom. So uh, the outer part of the uh, electron will go into, uh, will jump into the inner part. And uh, there will be one an energy gap between the uh, inner part, inner channel and the outer channel. So, uh, and the, the energy will be emitted uh, with X-ray fluorescence and different atoms will have a uh, different uh, chan electron channels, and so it will have a different uh, energy. So uh, different atom will emit different uh, X-rays, fluorescence, fluorescence. And that is the uh, basis that we can do qualitative and quantitative analysis. Okay, for this XRF technology, and uh, we need to know uh, what is the analysis range it has. Uh, <clears throat> for uh, the type of the sample, X-ray, it can test a solid sample and a liquid sample directly, but it cannot test uh, the air uh, type of the sample directly. Uh, sometimes if we want to test this kind of air, then we need to use film to collect the particles inside. To uh, change it into the solid part, then we can start to test. Yeah, this is from the type of uh, the samples. Uh, X3 is a very uh, common analysis tool, and it can analyze uh, samples concentration uh, from 100% and uh, down to uh, about 1 ppm. That is the range, general range of XRF. There are many uh, an analysis tools there, and XRF is one part of it, and the range is uh, in the middle. It can analyze uh, relatively high concentrations. And uh, for low concentrations, it will be difficult. And uh, that is uh, what we can benefit from HD XRF. Because X HD XRF is a wonderful tool. It can reduce the detection limit of the XRF down to 0 0.1 ppm level also. And uh, that is for the concentration range. And for the elements, XRF technology Generally, it can analyze uh, from uh, sodium to uranium. And for HDXRF, uh, this technology, we only focus on uh, 
soil and the heavy metal analysis. So generally, we set the hardware uh, to analyze elements from aluminum to uranium, and all the uh, common elements like uh, uh, copper, zinc, nickel, and the lead, arsenic, and mercury, these kind of hazardous elements, and we can analyze definitely without any problem. Okay, uh, and this slide, uh, we can see the basic uh, structure for traditional, uh, the first generation X3 uh, spectrometer. Uh, there are several parts of it. Uh, the first part is the X-ray source. Uh, we call it X-ray tube. It will uh, emit uh, multiple X-rays and shining on the samples. And it will, uh, the, the primary, we call this uh, actually primary X-ray, and it will interact uh, with the samples atoms, and the atoms will absorb some uh, primary X-rays and will emit their own uh, X-ray fluorescence. And uh, all the elements will uh, fluorescence will be uh, detected and collected by the detector. And detector will uh, will calculate and how much uh, uh, concentrations and how many elements it, it can detect. And this is very simple, and this is the first generation X3. And for this old uh, XRF technology, and it cannot uh, reach very low concentration, its uh, signal to background ratio is uh, generally is very low. And in this picture, and we can see the principal uh, hardware structure for HD high definition XRF technology. And uh, it's different from the previous one, obviously. And <clears throat> uh, we can see the picture here. And uh, after the X-ray tube shining the primary X-ray, uh, it is not uh, <clears throat> shining directly to the sample, but it is shining to the BCC. And BCC means a, a double curved crystal, and it's one kind of optical system. And uh, uh, this is our patent, our uh, technology. It has two functions. The first function, it can uh, monolize uh, the X-ray because uh, in uh, for the primary X-ray tube, uh, many wavelengths of X-ray tube is mixed together, and some of the noise signal uh, come from uh, the primary X-ray. But if we <clears throat> if we can modernize uh, and choose one or two or three uh, monochromatic X-rays to uh, analyze the sample, so we can have a much better performance of the results. And this is the first uh, uh, <clears throat> function. The second function of this BCC part uh, is to collect as much as X-rays, primary X-rays possible, and focus it on the sample. Uh, for this part, it can uh, make the most make the you make the most of uh, a primary X rays which is uh, as much as possible. Because uh, generally, if for the first generation, and the sample size is not very large, and we can only use one portion of the primary X rays, and the portion maybe uh, five to ten percent is not very much. But with the help of the DCC, and we can use up to maybe fifty percent of the primary X-ray energy. So we can uh, increase the sensitivity by this as well. And uh, for the, uh, the receive, uh, receiving part, and the same thing, uh, we are using a high-performance uh, silicon drift detector and uh, to collect the X-ray fluorescence from different atoms in the sample. And uh, this is structure. And when we can see this uh, <coughs> X-ray spectrum, and in this spectrum, uh, the X axis means uh, represents uh, different elements, and it's measured by a uh, KEV unit. And for the Y uh, Y values, it means uh, the count uh, uh, get the count gotten from uh, a detector. And uh, the black curve means the first generation X-ray uh, spectrum. And the red color means the second one, the second generation is HD XRF. And obviously, we can see uh, many ppm level uh, heavy metals are hidden in the black ones, and we can.
can see it is very high background. And we cannot uh, do qualitative or quantitative analysis for a heavy metal. And but uh, for the red color ones, and uh, we can see uh, many elements existed in the sample, and uh, it was very clear, and we can do analysis. So this is this picture shows um, the basic idea of H, the benefit <clears throat> from uh, HD XRF over the first generation XRF analyzer. Uh, in this slide, uh, here in the in the center of the, the slide, uh, it shows the picture of this product. In this product, um, we can see in the main part is the uh, GAN, and this is the X-ray source and detector, and uh, the digital pulse processor are assembled in this GAN. And there's a stand, test stand, and the GAN was assembled in the stand, and uh, the stand, we can take it onto the site to analysis. And also, uh, there's a HIM, uh, the kind of a controller, and it will control uh, the GANs to work, and it will display the results we get from the sample. And uh, we designed uh, the product in this way, and uh, it is uh, lightweight and uh, highly portable. And uh, generally, uh, it is, uh, you know, with the help of the stand, X-ray uh, is fully uh, protected, and it will not uh, harm uh, it will not uh, damage the health of any people because if we get the gun out and shoot uh, some uh, uh, samples, so it, people may be affected a little bit because of the scattering uh, X-ray. So it is pretty safe. And also uh, there are two fans integrated on the stand. So it's, mm, one is the summer days, it's very hot uh, on site. And uh, if we want to work continuously for several hours or five hours a day, so uh, if we do not have the fans, so uh, we cannot work for a long time. So generally, uh, after one or two hours, we have to uh, let the GAN to have a rest of like that. This uh, is a big problem for the first generation. And in the second generation, uh, we uh, just uh, make it better. And here, and we have totally three testing modes for uh, HD Roxanne product. And the first one we can see uh, is we put sample into a sample bag and put it, open the cover and put the sample bag in the, into the uh, test stand and close the cover, and we can do the test. Uh, this is the first one, and the second one uh, is we put the sample into the sample cup and uh, assemble it with a, a very thin X-ray film, and we put the cup into a platform. The platform uh, can, uh, can force the sample cup to move and oscillate. And uh, with the help of this, in this mode, uh, we can do quantitative analysis because uh, uh, we put samples we put soil sample in the cup, and uh, with the help of the rotating platform, so we can analyze much more uh, samples we have. So it will uh, it has much better uh, representatives of the real samples. This is uh, second testing mode. And here with the picture, we can get the gun out of the stand, uh, like the first generation uh, product. Uh, in this way, we can only do a screening job. Uh, because in some uh, contamination field, and uh, people need to find the contamination source, and so the best way and the most effective way is to uh, use again to fast the screening of the uh, the land and to know uh, where it's contaminated and how serious it is uh, in a general idea. And so it will be very fast, and generally within a uh, half minute, and uh, it is okay. And generally, with the GAN, we can uh, use uh, just a cover, a nose on the top of the GAN, and it can protect uh, the X-ray uh, X-ray GAN. And generally, we put one film bag between the soil samples and the GAN, uh, just to protect. And also, uh, we can put sample into the uh, some plastic bag, and we can use the GAN to shoot at the bag directly and to get the result for. Uh, called qualitative analysis. 
And here is uh, we have the industry uh, leading sensitivity. Here we can see the LOD of our product for arsenic is about uh, 0 0.5 for quantification mode and cadmium 0 0.8. And for the majority of, of the elements that we can uh, reach LOD around uh, 1 ppm level. And that is pretty low. And generally uh, for the first generation, they can only reach maybe around 10 ppm or so. So we can uh, uh, perform much better than the first generation. And this will be uh, very helpful for uh, some uh, elements like uh, arsenic, and then it should be very low, and mercury and cadmium, and sometimes uh, nickel. Uh, all these elements are generally are controlled uh, with very uh, low concentration, and uh, that is uh, the bad things we can do. And also, this t testing method, uh, it's uh, now uh, we are uh, trying to apply for the ASTM uh, standard test method. And right now, uh, we can find information on the website of ASTM. And here, uh, it's just, just uh, several weeks ago, we have successfully passed the first ballot uh, pr procedure. And we just uh, get only one uh, negative, uh, and this is ethical advice. And we will uh, change and work on it a little bit, and we will move to the uh, second one. So generally, uh, hopefully, uh, within this year, we can get this uh, AI, our ASTM method and uh, uh, formally <coughs> published. And we can see the name is new test method for uh, elemental analysis of soil and solid waste by a monochromatic energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectrometry and uh, using multiple monochromatic excitation beams. So uh, the most uh, uh, amazing things uh, happen because of the, we are using multiple monochromatic uh, excitation beams. And how we achieve this, we use a uh, DCC crystal to get this. Uh, so for quantitative analysis for heavy metals in soil, and generally right now, all the people uh, in the world, they are doing uh, laboratory uh, analysis. Uh, just like uh, ICP, MS, ICP, and uh, AAS, some such kind of technologies, and so uh, we cannot do quantitative, quantitative analysis. And we cannot do a quantitative analysis on site, so uh, <clears throat> we have to ship the sample back to the laboratories and wait for two or three days to get the results. And uh, this is not good. Generally, we cannot get uh, the feedback very fast enough to learn how is it going. And uh, if it is for one large contamination site, and we cannot just uh, to get a lot of samples for the first time, and we send all the samples to the laboratory and wait for one or two weeks. Well, after we know the results, then we uh, start to try to find uh, the second generation. And if we are doing this, it will cost over several months to do one site investigation, and this is ridiculous and too time uh, consuming. So with the help of this uh, machine uh, on site, a quantitative analysis machine, and we can do it much faster. And here uh, is the lab testing limitations and cost and time uh, limitations. A lab testing, generally it will cost uh, 30 to $150 uh, per sample, and depends on how many elements you want to you wanna know, and if you wanted an emergency or not. And uh, <clears throat> samples must be collected and packaged in a shape of the site, and delayed decisions are waiting for analytical results. And uh, if you are, uh, you need to do uh, the analyze, you are the uh, research institutes, or uh, you need to do some research of the samples. So uh, you have to build uh, laboratories and uh, you need to find some uh, chemical background experts to operate the chemical instruments and to, uh, to do the sample preparations. You need to deal with uh, many types of acid and uh, it's many points, maybe some poisonous, and also it's not that convenient to use. Also, it's very time consuming. And that is for quantitative analysis uh, for heavy metals and soil. Now we'll come to the uh, 
screening job, screening uh, of the heavy metals in soil, and compare with the handheld XRF testing. And we have some uh, obviously advantage. The first one, uh, far easy to use, and our biomedical equipment results is no problem. And uh, uh, the, the drawback and the disadvantages of the first generation is uh, very limited sensitivity. And this is a problem for uh, many customers because uh, they cannot analyze low enough for arsenic and mercury or cadmium, these kind of elements. Because, uh, the ROD generally is around 10 to uh, 20 ppm. So uh, if, if, if the real sample result is, for example, 16 ppm and it's dangerous and we need to remedy it, but we cannot use it again to get the result. So uh, that is kind of the, the problem for the first generation. Uh, here, uh, with the help of high-definition XR technology, uh, we can test and do qualitative and quantitative analysis at a regulatory level. And here we can check the numbers uh, uh, seriously for cadmium, for example, uh, the Shanghai standard target level. And this is one uh, regulation uh, for metals uh, in China, and uh, it's 1 ppm. Uh, here it is for solid waste, it's 1 ppm, and the EPM is 1 ppm. And generally, uh, the market leader is screening uh, LOD for the first generation. Uh, actually, spectrometer is about 25 ppm. It's pretty high. And uh, we can do uh, a quantify at 0 0.8, and this is low. And generally, it is uh, low enough to do a a screening job and uh, half, I think it's half uh, quantitative analysis for cadmium. Uh, for NICO, it's 50 and uh, one, one uh, is very low, and we can reach uh, uh, 3 ppm. And compared with competitor, it can not reach as low as this, of course, and for mercury also. So there are some elements that uh, controls with very low concentrations, and uh, we are, our ROD are quite close to these values. So uh, with, a, with the help of this technology, so it can uh, screen and test at a regulatory level. Now here, I will try to uh, introduce about the site investigation and remediation. Uh, we can see the picture and many of the field and or uh, seriously polluted, including up groundwater, soil operating facilities, contaminated buildings and sites. Uh, there are several steps to do uh, environment site assessment and uh, remediation. And uh, for the first of one or two phase, uh, we call it envir environmental site assessment. And in this step, in these steps, uh, generally, uh, the people need to uh, assess uh, the history of this site and if, uh, if there will be some possible uh, contaminants, contaminants there. And also, uh, if they think there will be, there might be danger, so they will use some machine. They will check the samples there and uh, to judge if it is uh, very dangerous or not, if they will need uh, environmental remediation if needed or not. Then, uh, if it is uh, polluted and uh, we need a remediation, so uh, in the third uh, phase, and so we, people will do a detailed investigation and uh, to make a remediation plan. And here is a good example of one uh, uh, contamination site for uh, mercury contamination and combined with some organic uh, contamination field. And this is what was a factory many years ago, and uh, it moves to the uh, remote area of the city. So uh, when this, the government will build uh, some resident uh, buildings there, so they need to, to evaluate, to assess uh, the site and uh, to remediate. And here we can see uh, the green color ones and the, the, the orange color ones. And I think the orange color ones means uh, the area uh, contaminated by uh, heavy metal mercury. And the area, and there are two millimeters written in, the, in one uh, orange area, and it means uh, the depth of the contamination is about two uh, meters deep. 
also uh, with the help of these on-site testing, testing tools, and uh, people can draw a clear map of the contamination. So uh, if without this uh, powerful tool, and uh, how can people do? They need to, to spend so much time and money and send to laboratories. This, this is not uh, practical. And uh, for mercury, the concentration generally is very low. So with the first generation, it also be very be uh, it will be very limited to use. And the fourth part is a uh, remediation performed. Uh, generally, engineering firms will uh, remediate the site, and uh, during after the finish and during the process of the remediation, so they will need one uh, instrument to check uh, how is it going with their. Uh, remediation procedure, if it is working well or not, and how well it is, if it is finished or not. And uh, the last part is remediation verified. Generally, uh, uh, one site is uh, completed for a remediation, generally the government uh, institutes and it will uh, get some samples to certify and to check if the site is uh, okay or not. And generally, with uh, uh, in this part, and uh, people will need to use a uh, chemical method to get the uh, certified values. But uh, after, I think uh, one uh, of our method, AFM method, was uh, is formally published. So I think we can use uh, ASTM method to get a sample and to form some report. So it can uh, reduce the cost. Uh, here, uh, we have some, uh, we have done a lot of tests and gained a lot of uh, real world data for reference materials and real samples. Here is one example for uh, NISA reference samples for uh, NISA 27 and 10, uh, this SRM samples. Uh, we can see, uh, we tested for a repeatability test and uh, the chromium concentration is about around 20 meters, about uh, around 9 to uh, 9 ppm, the KM is about 12 ppm. And uh, we can, uh, after the test, uh, we can see uh, the RSD is about uh, within 10 percent generally. And if the concentration is goes lower, so RSD will be uh, higher. And here's another one for uh, 2711 uh, NISA samples. And in this sample, we can find a low concentration of uh, mercury and it's about uh, uh, 7.4 ppm. And uh, we can get a pretty good uh, repeatability. And uh, please note that generally for the first generation uh, XR spectrometer and the LOD is higher than 10 ppm. So it can never test uh, 7 ppm samples. Uh, here we gain uh, a lot of data in China and uh, we have tested uh, here is about maybe 15 or 18 uh, uh, Chinese local uh, reference materials, and uh, we make a statics of this table and of the result. Uh, we, when we check uh, carefully about uh, all these elements, and we can see we can get uh, a pretty good correlation with the 35 values. And uh, for uh, we can see for arsenic, and we can get a uh, 4 ppm around 4 ppm samples, 6 ppm, and even 2 ppm samples, we get pretty well results. And for cadmium, we can reach 4 ppm, 2 ppm results. And uh, that is pretty low. And uh, here uh, is one uh, test of project. Um, wrong on the display, I think. Uh, well, uh, we got this. Uh, a uh, real practice uh, in China. There's one uh, site, and uh, people do uh, people collected a lot of uh, samples there and measured by uh, the first generation XRF and our HD XRF, and also they sent to the laboratories to get ICP results for arsenic. And here we can see compare the results. Uh, our HD XRF test method they have a very good correlation with the ICP method, and we can see. Uh, a correlation uh, R square should be about 0 0.9, and for the first generation, and uh, it is bad, and uh, maybe 0 0.7 or 0 0.6, something like that. And here, as 
B zero uh, one means the first generation, uh, the first region, uh, because generally when people do a uh, site investigation, they will divide uh, a site into many regions. And uh, after the dash uh, three point two means three point two meters deep, so they will uh, measure and record uh, each sample in this way. Uh, here is a very good example to show that uh, we have some uh, practical experience. We compared with uh, some laboratories to check the result. And we sent uh, one, two, three, four, seven samples checked by HDXRF, and we sent to uh, uh, two uh, third party labs and get the result. And uh, here we can see for the most uh, samples and results, we can get pretty well a correlation with the laboratory analysis. But uh, when we see this, uh, once we led this, we can find uh, for the first uh, ICP result, it can give almost uh, twice the result as HDXR and the second uh, laboratory does. So uh, generally, uh, chemical method and I think this will happen uh, uh, again and again in future. And this has this is very common because we send the same samples to different laboratories, but we'll get some different results. So uh, that is one uh, limitation for a chemical method because uh, it, every man uh, can make a mistake. But for HDXRF, uh, its operation is very simple and it has a very high uh, uh, repeatability. And uh, so uh, generally, uh, no matter who is operating this in instrument, they will get very close results. Uh, here is some uh, real data. Okay, so uh, many uh, people, maybe you are curious to know uh, for the technical, if there will be some influence factors. Yes, I think uh, each uh, uh, technical tools, it has its own uh, limitations here, and I will introduce you about a little, the main uh, influence factors for this technique. Uh, here in this photo, we can see some real uh, soil samples, some, some like, uh, uh, sediment and some rock particles, some sand samples, yeah. And the largest uh, influence factors, we can call the heterogeneity between samples because uh, heavy metals in soil on site is not homogeneous at all. And uh, we can find uh, one part, maybe 1,000 ppm for lead and uh, up to with it, a distance for one feet and the result can drop to uh, 100 ppm. And that's the truth. And uh, we can find this happily, uh, we can find this uh, in the real site. So this can cause the biggest, largest uh, deviation uh, for the comparison of analysis. It's called a heterogeneity between the samples. And also there will be heterogeneity between the samples. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, <clears throat> uh, sample representative is a challenge, yes, and uh, when we get one sample sent to the laboratories, uh, for example, for chemical instrument, it can analyze only one or two gram samples, but how much sample it can represent for, for the samples on site, generally people will get a sample like uh, several hundred or, or one or two kilograms, and after they get on the whole process and transportation and the sampling, they will just analyze one gram of it. And can one uh, gram of the sample represent uh, several kilogram samples? So that is a challenge, that may be a problem. And here, uh, in the next slide, uh, we introduce you a, a true story. Uh, within sample heterogeneity, um, you know, soil are composed by different particle size, and different particle size can have different element concentrations. And uh, this is amazing, but it is the truth. Uh, for example, if we mesh a sample uh, less than 200 mesh, the lead result can reach around 2,000 ppm. But if we test a large particle, it's a, a four mesh around, so the result can up to, uh, can go low to 50 ppm. So uh, this means that if we test the sample directly with our GANs means that we are analyzing the average values for all of these particles. So uh, when we compare the result with uh, ICP sometimes, 
So we need to make sure that the samples we are testing are the exact samples ICPs are uh, testing. Uh, if we uh, XRF and technology want to do a uh, quantitative analysis, so generally we will need to do some very simple sample preparation. And for example, this is a real sample a block of uh, soil, and the, we will uh, dry it naturally, or we use some uh, tools to make it dry faster. And after that, we can use a manually uh, tool to make it into small particles, and we use a sieve to sieve it and. Uh, I think in the U.S., uh, our, we need to to, uh, to, to save it uh, to 60 mesh. And that's, uh, there's another uh, effect, influence factor, it's called moisture effect. And we have done some experiments that uh, we uh, get one sample, we have uh, these uh, heavy metals inside, and we add different moistures and weight it and uh, to test. Uh, the result. After that, we can find uh, the rule is like that. All heavy metals show the same trend for different moistures. And in general, uh, 40 to 60 percent moisture will be the maximum for the, uh, the, the moisture in the sample. And moisture can cause the result lower. And generally, 20 percent moisture can cause about 20 percent to 30 percent lower for the element concentration. Here is a, a case study we did uh, in the U.S. Geneva uh, Foundry case study, and uh, in this uh, study, and it was an important uh, economic driver in the western New York town. And uh, the, after 125 years of operation of the foundry was closed in 1988, analysis of sludge for the foundry's air pollution control system is in so it indicate that. Lead and arsenic were likely emitted prior to in its installation. So uh, in this case, uh, and we uh, customers need to analyze arsenic and lead concentration in the very large area. And there are several uh, key challenges for this project. The first one is a very large number of samples were needed to characterize uh, the area of the entry. This is a large area and. Uh, we definitely need a lot of samples to uh, characterize how it, uh, it is contaminated and uh, how serious it is like that. So uh, the samples, they need to be tested are very large. Uh, the second one, there were other potential sources of contamination. Uh, the area surrounding this area is primarily residential and represents its own challenges. So uh, it's not only uh, arsenic, but maybe some other uh, potential contaminant sources. So uh, uh, we need to be very careful and uh, we need to check the whole area very seriously then we can get the, re get the very clear page for the site. And the solution, and with the help of our technology and the guy who is working there, uh, it gets the ability to test, to measure the soil samples for lead, arsenic, uh, very quickly and easily, and uh, they save a lot of time using this because uh, uh, we can analyze for lead and sonic, generally uh, one sample, which is to screening half minutes and we can finish the test. And we can reach uh, one or two ppm LOD of that, and that it will be quite enough for the customers to use. So uh, by using AC rock sand, the camera was able to build a large data set needed to characterize the area and record enough samples to understand the heterogeneous nature of the contamination surrounding this area. Uh, here, and we can see uh, after uh, HCS is a wonderful tool to help the customer to do this, but it will not represent all the work for the chemical uh, laboratory analysis. But it can greatly reduce uh, the numbers of samples being sent to the laboratories. Uh, here we can see the customer after uh, collect some samples and sent to the laboratories and compare with HDRs results. And it has, it has very good uh, correlation for arsenic and lead. And with the money spent at the site, we could buy an uh, HD rock stand and complete the investigation in a week with a few lab confirmatory samples. 
and this is what the, the customer say to evaluate. Okay, uh, I finished my presentation and thanks for your uh, uh, joining this uh, part. And Connie, so are there? Maybe we can uh, move to the next part. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And we do have a question. Do snow or extreme cold or high humidity affect the instrument? Uh, yes, I think uh, I had already introduced uh, the humidity and moisture effect of the instrument. Uh, generally, uh, if the sample there is high moisture, it can affect the result. And we, after we get uh, enough experiments, and we know how much effect it can be. And generally, uh, the temperature in operation is uh, from um, 15 degrees below zero to 15 degrees centigrade below zero and high to uh, 40 or 50, 50 uh, degrees centigrade. Generally, we recommend the instrument to use uh, within this range of uh, the temperature outside. And at this point, there are no other questions. Oh, we just had one come in. Just one moment, please. Are these units rented, sold, or both? If so, how much? Uh, uh, is Kyle here? Hi, this is uh, Kyle Kowitzki. I'm the I'm the product manager for this product. Um, I can I can take that question. Um, these units are available for uh, rent or sale. Um, if you wanted to get in touch with us, uh, things do vary by region um, a little bit, but uh, the the pricing tends to be very competitive with if you've had experience with renting or purchasing XRF in the past. Um, uh, you know, you can reach out to the uh, contact information there, or you can email us at info at xos.com. And we have another question about the moisture. Does that mean water in the sample or the humidity in the air? Uh, um, it means so water in samples, but not the humidity in the air. Yeah, so uh, so moisture that's in the sample. Um, typically, if there's moisture above around 15%, it can start to um, absorb some of the x-rays and bias the result down um, below. Uh, so typically, to get the absolute best quantitative result, you would want to dry the sample beforehand. But certainly, uh, you can get very, result, very good results for, for samples that I uh, do have some moisture in them as you're in your earlier stages of site evaluation. Um, typically, you, you can really tell. By the time that it's getting up to being a, a problem, you can typically start to see that, that the sample is either very muddy or um, you can see water uh, in the sample at that point. And how long does it take to learn how to use the instrument? The, the instrument's actually uh, very easy to use. Um, most of the training that goes on is, is resu results from the fact that it has an open x-ray beam. And so that means that you are able to uh, have x-rays that are not in a shielded environment. And so any operator using it uh, needs to go through, uh, we, have, we provide training with the instrument that takes maybe an hour to an hour and a half to learn how to use. But actually operating the instrument uh, typically, when, when uh, we show people within, you know, five to ten minutes, they can be up and running and understanding just about everything that they would need to know to be able to take data. How many hours um, the x-ray tube can go before changing the tube? Um, I don't have a, a, a good answer on the number of the hours. Uh, typically, we expect the x-ray tube, depending on, uh, you know, the hours would be a good way of putting that. But 
but typically we expect it to last uh, three to five years before needing a change. The HDXRF instrument is used for the initial site characterization and not for compliance or closure samples. Is this correct? So the specific regulations for your geography are going to really dictate what um, what method you are required to use for uh, closure samples. Um, one of the, one of the big reasons and one of the impacts we think that's going to be really valuable to working with ASTM is to give a um, consensus body-based method that uh, going forward uh, organizations will be able to use to quantitatively determine in the field that uh, the, the results are good. So typically uh, what we're finding at this stage without having that method in place is that it's very good for basically knowing the answer um, before you go to the, the time and trouble of sending samples to a lab to, to really get those closure. Uh, for instance, um, being able to to determine that, hey, I know what result I'm going to get when I send this to the lab. So I won't send something to the lab that maybe doesn't pass or doesn't allow me to close the site. I can know that, okay, this sample uh, here, this area here, I need to continue to make sure that it's complete and that the levels are at the at what my, my needed are for, for my plan for the site so that I can actually close it. Um, Are there specific chemical interferences that affect the results? Certainly. Um, so how this works is it, it looks at a spectrum, and there are potential for certain elephant elements to affect each other. And this is the case for all spectra, uh, spectrographic results, whether it's the laboratory or whether it's uh, the first generation of XRF. One of the really good benefits of using uh, HDXRF technology is the fact that you, ex uh, to extreme extent, you lower the background signal. And what that means is that you get much, much better resolution in your sample spectrum that you're using to determine the results. And so what that means is that you're able to resolve things that are um, much, much more difficult uh, to do if you don't have that resolution. So one of the examples um, that I like to use, and, and Justin went over this in his presentation about the case study. So at this site, there was hundreds of ppm of lead, and they were also interested in looking at um, single-digit or double-digit ppm arsenic. Lead and arsenic uh, typically are found uh, in the same locations, and so this is uh, definitely two elements that you want to be able to uh, resolve very clearly. Um, the spectrum that we're looking at for lead and arsenic happen to be very close together. Um, they're 0.1 EV. Uh, EV. So that's, that's very close together, and it's been a challenge for, for uh, X-ray fluorescence techniques in the past to be able to resolve the difference between those two. Uh, particularly here, you know, the uh, lead was at levels that were 10 times or more than 10 times the level of the arsenic. This is something that we have heard uh, over and over from the industry that uh, they're not able to resolve, and it's something that comes up very frequently. In this case, uh, the instrument was able to, to identify those single-digit and double-digit, uh, you know, low double-digit ppm arsenic in the presence of, you know, two, three, four hundred ppm of lead. So that's a, a good example of uh, the benefit of using this technology. How often do we need to calibrate the HD rock sand? That's, a, that's another great benefit of, of using this technology. Because we remove all of the background, we end up with a very, very stable spectrum. And so calibration, uh, we would recommend that you, uh, the, the instrument comes with a validation sample. So that's a sample that's a certified reference material. We know what the values are in it. You're able to check that daily or weekly, um, whatever you set up in your QC plan to, to say that's the frequency that you want to check the instrument. But our expectation is that calibration uh, would only be, need to be done maybe every six months or maybe possibly yearly, um, really, just based on those checks. So when you check the validation sample, you'd expect to find it near to the certified results. And when you start to see a drift or um, if you start to see uh, results outside of there, then might be the time to calibrate. And we would only expect that to be about mm, once or twice a year. 
Now, you may have already covered this, but on one of the slides, the response for lead and arsenic were the, in the same location. Is there any concern with differentiation of the, these two compounds? Yeah, I kind of did address that, and, and it's uh, sort of interesting that the, the Geneva case study that Justine covered uh, really touched on that. But, um, you know, lead and arsenic are certainly uh, ones that, you know, anybody who's used XRF in the field knows that that can be a real problem for identifying the arsenic. Um, um, and so certainly we're still going to have effects. If there's high lead in the presence of arsenic, you probably won't be able to identify the arsenic at quite as low levels. But um, what we found is that typically, you know, if the lead is not present, we could see the arsenic at 1 ppm or even uh, just below, uh, detect it just below 1 ppm. But a lot of times the action levels for arsenic are around that uh, 10 ppm to 20 ppm range. And even in the presence of, of several hundred ppm of lead uh, uh, on the site, we were actually able to demonstrate that, that this was not an issue with being able to identify the arsenic. And in order to to get correct data, we have to dry the sample. Is, does that mean even using handheld XRF and we have to test samples in the lab, not directly test samples outdoors? So um, I would say that to, to get the absolute most uh, repeatable uh, lowest limits of detection that you do, uh, we would recommend drying the sample until it doesn't change mass. That's something you could do um, in the field. There's actually an EPA 6200 method that describes this. Um, you can use, uh, if you have electricity source in the field, you could use some sort of portable uh, toaster oven or something like that to accelerate the process. Uh, you could lay out the sample and leave it to dry overnight, um, something like this. Uh, the one area to caution is that if you are interested in mercury, that can volatilize uh, or um, you know, leave into the air uh, at elevated temperatures. And so if that's an element of interest, you would probably want to do uh, an air drying process. Uh, but absolutely, um, you don't, you can do this, uh, you can do uh, very low level analysis in the field um, by drying the sample there. Or um, even, even as I mentioned, we don't typically see much of a response below 15% moisture. Um, so that that would uh, that would be my recommendation there. And the display was not shown. How easily are they viewed for various elements? Um, yes. So the uh, display for the uh, analyzer uh, is a, a very large uh, touchscreen. Uh, you can select uh, by the user or it has default sets of, of uh, elements that are typically interesting in this field of up to 14 elements. And so these are large, uh, we call them cards, uh, that display the element, they display um, uh, what the concentration is. You can also set levels uh, that you would be interested uh, in flagging yourself. So if you're interested at looking, uh, wanting to know any sample that's over 16 ppm arsenic, you could set up the instrument so that if the result was over that, uh, it would flag you and it would turn the, the card red. And these are about, um, they're probably about uh, one and a half inch square uh, cards. So they're very easily visible. If you're looking to look at all of the element list, it's possible there's a secondary screen and this would be uh, in a list that would just show you all of the elements uh, that are available. But for for most projects, you're, you're looking at a, a limited list. Uh, you know, you have the elements that you're specifically interested in, and um, you can set those up on the main screen, or you can use one of the default settings that probably covers, uh, you know, the main elements that you would be interested in. And at this time, there are no more questions. Any right. last thoughts or comments? Well, I, uh, I wanted to uh, thank Justin uh, for his presentation. That was really informative, and I hope answered a lot of the questions that, that everyone came here to see. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the product, please reach out to us. Um, you can reach us at info at xos.com, or you can also find us at www.xos.com. Um, so thank you again. Once again, Justin, great presentation, and thank you to the 
uh, audience for um, your participation and your questions. I think it was a, a really great session.